Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 10. So uh, as you can see from the title, we're going to kind of be continuing this week's theme of the functional programming aspects of Scala. Uh, unlike the last few lectures, this one's actually going to be more so in the Scala and less so in the chisel. Uh, you know, we introduced, you know, the idea of doing things like map and for each on Monday about kind of ways to work with collections of things and perhaps use that nicely in our hardware to you know, maybe extract signals or to do connections in a nice kind of automated way. And then on Wednesday, we talked about how to aggregate things, you know, with using fold or reduce. Uh, today, we're going to kind of round out some of the things in Scala. I felt like it's kind of important to be aware of some of these constructs. And although we may not have very concise little, like, you know, you know 10 line chisel examples, uh, I just start dealing with larger collections of things in Scala. It'd be helpful to know these things. Um, as well as I've kind of had this thing called pattern matching for a while, and we're going to see some examples of that at the end. Oops, so let's go ahead and advance the slides. So as I just kind of said, what we're going to do is we're going to first conclude kind of in a Scala land. There's a few more of these uh, collective operations uh, we haven't really uh, talked about. I want to make sure we kind of cross those off. We're going to talk about pattern matching. And then finally, uh, maybe some more graceful ways to deal with option. Where you maybe remember or observe that both myself and TA were looking at things like dot is defined or dot get on an option or a little bit, you know, confused or, you know, seeming odd. The reason why is we never do it that way. Uh, but uh, in order to kind of handle the more graceful ways we need the things we've covered this week, and now that we've learned the things we've learned this week, we can handle it more gracefully. Okay, so uh, we can do this, although I don't think I have any chisel in today's lecture, so this is kind of, I guess, a not super critical thing. Um, so first, let's talk about this flat map operation in Scala. So uh, for the most part, we've been using map where we do things kind of one-to-one, -one, right? As an element comes in, element comes out. Element comes in, element comes out. Um, there may be situations where perhaps you have an element that comes in and you don't necessarily want an element to come out. Uh, that could be done with a filter. We're going to cover that in a few minutes. Uh, but there also could be cases where you know, have an element coming in and somehow it's going to produce not just one element, but maybe a collection of elements, right? So, you know, uh, and when you think about how you want your resulting collection to look, rather than it being, you know, uh, like a list of lists, right? You know, for each element can turn into some sort of collection. Perhaps you wish those collections were aggregated and uh, you know, concatenated rather than just simply uh, in parallel, right? So if you have a list of lists, uh, there's an operation called flatten where you kind of you know, can turn it into a single list, right? It takes all the contents of each of those internal lists and appends them all. Uh, and so flat map kind of does that already for us. So if you were in a situation where you were calling you know, dot map and later on calling dot flatten, you can call flat map. Uh, flat map is actually really powerful. You can uh, kind of mimic a lot of the other behaviors with flat map, including even map. Uh, you can kind of mimic map with flat map. You can uh, mimic filter which cover a few minutes with flat map. Uh, so you, sometimes kind of people think their favorite operator to use. Um, and I, that's why I felt it was important to cover this uh, in this course right now to make sure you're familiar with this. Like I said, this number of circumstances where you may use this in chisel may not be super common. I even was grepping on large chisel code bases for how often I use flat map. And the places I could find, there was a handful. Uh, usually those... Um, uh, some of those were in pure Scala stuff. Some of them actually were in Chisel, but there's a handful, right? So it's way less used in, you know, map or for each. But uh, you're going to see a lot of Scala code. That's why we should cover it. So here in a hypothetical example, you know, we just make a little collection to play with. Uh, let's make a, a sequence, okay? And so, you know, as a reminder, uh, maybe I'll comment this out first, right? So the fill operation, right, uh, you know, given uh, a number of elements and initial value, right? We're going to get that many copies of it. So we're going to get two copies of three. So now, for example, if I, you know, uh, wanted to, uh, you know, uh, take the numbers 0 through 4 and uh, apply fill in this way, which is kind of an arbitrary contrived example, uh, what do we see? Okay, you know, 0, 0 times, 1, 1 time, 2, 2 times, 3, 3 times, 4, 4 times, right? And so you can kind of see how those elements of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 were mapped to a seek, right? So now we kind of have... In this case, the compiler is kind of automatically choosing concrete classes for us. So, you know, it shows uh, a vector and a list, but think of those collections, right? Uh, so it's like a 2D collection in a way, right? Where we kind of have this outer collection, which was kind of corresponding to this outer collection. And then those elements were turned into collections in themselves, right? So perhaps it's not what we want. Perhaps we don't want to see, uh, you know, a list of lists, right? So what we could do is we could um, flatten it, right? And now the way it's printing, it makes it a little awkward for us. Oops. 
But you can see, uh, maybe I'll actually just have to uh, wrap this in a print line, so that way we can kind of keep things uh, all hunky-dory. Great. Yeah, so we can kind of see it, right? So um, as you can see, uh, it um, does, uh, you know, what we expect, right? Okay, so the first one has a list of lists, and then we go in and we say, hey, flatten, right? We want to remove that, you know, level of nesting. Now, what happens if I call, like, flatten on an already uh, flattened list? It should just do nothing, right? Oops. Or it doesn't know how to flatten the collections, right? But it normally wouldn't do that. But, uh, okay. So, great. Um, and then with flat map, of course, we can uh, do this all at once. And I guess I'll keep it consistent with the other examples. So it fits on the slide. Okay, um, like I said, so flat map's a, a pretty powerful thing. Uh, like I said, for some people, it's kind of like their go-to favorite uh, thing to use, because like they said you can kind of use it in different ways. Um, so I mentioned how it can kind of mimic like this thing called filter we're gonna describe. It can do map. Uh, it can also kind of do flat, unless it was four specifically. Uh, there's another thing called collect, um, which we're probably not gonna cover. If we do cover, we'll cover that next week. Uh, and it can also kind of mimic collect, right? So it's really pretty, pretty versatile. Um, this is kind of something you're probably perhaps starting to notice with all these different features here is that Scala is perhaps the uh, opposite of the risk philosophy, right? So maybe if you're familiar with your architecture class and you know, reduce instruction to set computing where it's all about, you know, getting that minimal set of ISA instructions and then, you know, composing them to build the bigger operations we need. Uh, Scala is pretty generous with the operations, right? They definitely were not trying to do things. And so in some cases in language, there are multiple ways to do something. Right, it's kind of a common challenge of how do we, you know, make that readable or tractable or why there's so many different ways of doing things. Um, the kind of philosophy is uh, sometimes having uh, one thing that can replace two or three things combined together doesn't just make code shorter, but can perhaps uh, make your intent more clear. And also, as you start scaling up, uh, it actually can improve your performance. Right, where uh, you know this is a uh, garbage collected language, so if you do look at you know, sequence of, you know, map and then reduce and then something else and all those other things kind of chain together, those intermediate collections get created and need to be, you know, each of those causes, you know, object invocations and function calls and uh, garbage and nested garbage collected later on. Versus if you can go ahead and say what you want to do right away, uh, you can have fewer passes over the data, fewer times it's all happening. Right? For example, going from, you know, a map and a flatten to just a flat map, right? We've cut out a whole operation, right? So normally such, you know, over eager optimization would be super critical, but in Scala land, where there's a pretty rich vocabulary, but still a learnable amount of vocabulary, I would argue, it's kind of nice to do this, right? So uh, on the webpage, under the Scala reference section, I did link, the very last link is to this blog by Sky Pavel, and it's actually a really helpful blog, because what he does is he uh, kind of describes common idioms or common mistakes of um, writing Scala. In many cases, what he's doing is he's kind of alerting you to yet another method available in Scala you may not be aware of, right? Where it's like, I could do this, this, and this, but oh wait, uh, this something is already there for that. And that's kind of what the summary point of a lot of those points are. So uh, today I'm kind of covering just a handful of these. Believe it or not, after this entire week, we've still only covered a fraction of what's available. <laughs> uh, but if you have to be curious, go ahead and either peek at the API docs for Scala or just kind of keep looking around or definitely go read Pavel's blog, which I linked. So I think it's really helpful. Uh, before I go on, any questions on flat map? Okay, uh, let's continue. Um, so, so far what we've been doing is we've been uh, taking operations that directly modify the data. You know, we've been uh, mapping it, we've been doing something. Uh, alternatively, there's some collective operations that work what's called a predicate. Now, a predicate is a, a function that given a single element returns a Boolean, true or false. And depending on which uh, operation we give it, we can kind of change the behavior, right? So, for example, you know, filter, uh, if true, uh, you know, we keep the item. If it's if the predicate value is a false in the element, we don't keep it. So it's a way to kind of, you know, downsize our collections. Um, so maybe we'll go ahead and do that one first. We'll come to the other two uh, in just a second. And so, um, as you can see, you know, here we just made a generic range. This is to get a collection to play with. 
you know, maybe we defined our predicate uh, in this case as something that was, you know, is even. Uh, you know, it's okay, it takes in an element, returns a Boolean, you know, and hey, if it, you know, mod two equals one or equals zero, it's even, and if not, it's one, right? And so uh, we could just as well have, you know, um, uh, you know, put this in directly here, right? We can go ahead and use that placeholder syntax just as fine. Uh, the reason why I took the time to the label as a function, number one is to, you know, remind us of the signature of these predicate functions. Uh, but additionally, uh, you can see that, for example, let's say I wanted to do the reverse case. Now, maybe you might be going in and trying to map it. Like, you know, maybe you might say, oh, shoot, I want to use is even but I um, want to take the not of that, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say like something like this, right? Uh, this might be what you would do, right? If you wanted to do it. And you could do that, right? But once again, like I said, Scala is, you know, very, very rich, so you don't need to do that. You can just say uh, filter not, right? And it does the opposite of it. Okay, so you can filter, filter not, handles the, you know, the predication and indication for you. Okay, so then there's two more, uh, you know, qualifiers here you can use. Uh, so for all, uh, so of course, as you can see from the name here, right, uh, if you have a collection and you apply this predicate, this whole thing is going to turn your entire collection down into a single Boolean value, right? And either uh, if this predicate holds for everything, great, it's true. If any one of them is not true, it's false, right? And so that's for all, it has to be true for all of them. And then exists, you know, is the, the Morgan's inverse of that, which is if at least one of them is true, right? Um, so if we go ahead and, you know, plug these in, you know, you know, all they, are they all, uh, for example, even? No, no, they are not all even. Now, what if, for example, if I uh, was a little tricky <laughs> and something like this, right? And it took the even numbers and asked if they're all even? Yes, yes, that's true. Um, but, you know, uh, that kind of depends, right? So we can go ahead and, uh, you know, undo that. Uh, and then likewise, uh, you know, if we ask, hey, is at least one of them even? Yes, yes, we know that. But hey, maybe we could go ahead and, uh, you know, do the same trick again, be naughty. And yeah, none of them are even because we already chose numbers that were not even, right? So we know that, uh, you know, uh, tautologically, right? But, um, these are a couple of things, right? So you can kind of see now it's kind of a pretty rich vocabulary and language building up all these things in Scala where, you know, we can have a collection of things, we can go ahead and map it, reduce it. Uh, we can have those things turn into elements and then, you know, flat map them or something. We can filter them. We can see how things apply across all of them. So this is hopefully starting to show you some of the niceness of this language, the kind of funness of this language, right? So for example, you know, some of the most notable things made in Scala are things like Spark, for example, not just Chisel, which you know, Spark, you know, being a, uh, you know, large scale uh, data processing uh, framework, uh, you can imagine it's really helpful, right? When you're trying to toss around lots of types of data and lots of collections and move things around and have your, you know, resilient data structures. It's very helpful, right? It's a really nice kind of feature in Japanese language. Uh, cool. So it's kind of just kind of showing kind of a tour of some of these nice features. And so now I'm gonna have a couple of these kind of more prolonged examples. And these are both an opportunity not only to see these features in action, but for us also to spend a little bit of time thinking about uh, how we actually compose these together to actually solve a problem. So one process problem might be, let's say you want to find primes. And you don't just want to see if a number is prime, you want to find you know, all the primes of some value, right? Uh, and so uh, one way to do it, of course, is to for every number to just start dividing, right? Say I want to see if x is prime, okay, well then I just see, okay, does two divide x, does three divide x, does four divide x, does five divide x? Um, and then, okay, that's x. And then if I want to do an entire range of numbers, okay, then what about x plus one? Same thing. Okay, then what about x plus two? And you could definitely do that. Uh, a more efficient algorithm is like a, one of them is something called a sieve, right? Where basically you are going to attempt to uh, learn something about multiple numbers at the same time. So one of these very classic sieves basically takes a number and let's say it's number two and uh, you generate the entire range of numbers you care about. So in this case, you can see we're, for example, gonna do uh, all numbers maybe from two to 100. Uh, and it goes ahead and removes all multiples of two. In this case, when I say multiple, I'm meaning, uh, you know, greater than one, right? So it's you know, not just two times one, but like two times two or up, right? So for example, so okay. So uh, it goes ahead and removes all those, right? It's kind of the process for the C. 
And basically what you do is you go through and you um, uh, take a number and you declare that prime and then you remove all multiples of that from the collection. So that way you are, uh, you know, uh, not going to see that those things again. So there's no need to actually kind of keep dividing each number. Instead, what you're doing is you kind of keep constantly filtering things out in your collection to see what you're left with. It should be primes. So let's kind of talk through what we're doing here. So, and we're going to use some of the features we're covering last week. So, for example, starting off, right, this multiple of function, right? So it takes in two arguments. We're using that currying syntax. We have it as two separate argument lists. Uh, and it's going to take in these two numbers and give us a Boolean, right? So what we're asking is, hey, um, like I said, the way we define it in this case, we're saying if it's one times the number, we're calling that uh, not a multiple, right? So if they're not equal and uh, A does not evenly divide it, okay, then we're going to say it's a multiple of it. All right, and then now we can go right away, uh, right ahead and use that filter function, right? So what we want to do uh, is remove everything that is a multiple of something, right? So if this predicate is going to evaluate to true for things we want to remove, then we want to use filter not to remove them. So if you can see what this function, of course, is going to do is that, hey, you know, given, uh, you know, a, a list and uh, a number, we're going to go ahead and remove, uh, you know, all multiples of that number, right? So for example, uh, if we have, you know, all numbers from 2 to 100, maybe we'll go ahead and wrap this on the print line again. So we can see, for example, uh, you know, how this looked, right? We are removing all multiples of five, right? So five we're keeping in the first time, but then we're not keeping it for later copies. Sure. Um, and then uh, if we were to, uh, you know, actually use the function we defined, right? It's going to do the same thing, which I should also probably wrap in the print line because it's going to run off the screen. Great. Uh, so we see that first five is still there, but the later ones are not. Okay, so now let's put this together into our C function. So what are we going to do? Uh, it's going to be a recursive function. So we can see we're going to call it again. Uh, base case first, right? So um, if uh, we are dealing with an empty collection, we've reached the base case, looking more to return. Otherwise, we take the head of the collection that's remaining, call that prime. So we're going to, uh, you know, return that as part of the lit return. And then we're going to append that with the remainder of the collection. And um, we're going to remove all instances of it. So we're taking the collection, not in counting the head, right? And we're going to remove all of those uh, instances. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and run it. And so what do we get when we run this? We should get... Uh, the right answer, right? So here's the primes up to um, uh, 100, right? Uh, and that's kind of a pretty interesting kind of compact way of doing this, both between using the sieve as well as the functional programming things. And now technically because uh, I used uh, tail, there's no chance of that times one copy to prime still existing. I guess we could go ahead and remove this and it should still work just fine. Yes, it does. Um, so don't have to worry about you know, semantics of when I say multiple, what do I mean? Uh, but yeah, so you can see that. So it's kind of pretty neat, right? So we kind of built up a few abstractions. This is kind of a way I recommend um, kind of getting through things is to kind of build up worthwhile abstractions. That way it's kind of understandable what we're doing kind of step by step. You know, I could just as well have, uh, you know, put this in line, uh, you know, inside of, uh, you know, here. And I could have even uh, applied this uh, thing inside of there, but by kind of breaking it up and naming these things, it's kind of easier for us to kind of keep track of it all. Um, so cool. Um, questions on this example? And you can imagine, of course, you could, you know, do a little more housekeeping and wrap this up in a function where it takes in the upper limit and automatically calls this, et cetera. Cool, okay, let's, let's try uh, some more. So uh, we may have seen these already. I kind of suggested this strongly in the uh, tips for homework two, but it's worth being explicit. So for some very common reduction patterns, it's already in the language, right? So you might be trying to either use reduce or fold left to perform these operations in a way that makes sense. 
but uh, it's already there, right? So for things like uh, taking the sum of all the items in the collection, taking the product, taking the min, taking the max, um, that's all there. Now this is all in Scala. Now as Chisel developers, we're like, oh wait, does that mean I get to use these? Not quite. Sometimes if the stars align perfectly, you have a, like a Scala collection of Chisel objects and you have the right version and stuff works out, yes, you can use these. These are more helpful in purely in Scala land. In Chisel land, uh, as I mentioned in Homework 2 instructions, there's a pop count instruction, for example, which is going to count the number of one bits in a uh, uint, and that's going to be really, or sorry, seek of bulls, and that's going to be really helpful for that game of life problem if you haven't already solved that one. Um, but as you can see right here, I kind of showed if you did it manually as a reduce, but you know, you can just more quickly kind of say what you want. You want the product, the sum, the min, the max, uh, etc. So these aren't super uh, surprising, but it's worth knowing they're there rather than kind of reinventing that wheel. Um, cool. Okay. No questions so far. Um, so now for a, a bigger uh, example, uh, let's try and use the functional programming to do matrix multiplication. So it's kind of a nice example where we're kind of going to uh, have a lot of collections, a lot of elements, and then kind of be shuffling them all around. So uh, for this problem, uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, 2D sequences as kind of our way of representing a, a matrix. Um, and so what do we have? Well, we could go ahead and just fill up some data. So for example, if you remember this tablet operation, uh, you know, we can say, hey, so I want to go ahead and fill the sequence up from the beginning and say, hey, give me a, you know, a four by four. And so it's going to give us two arguments to our function, right? It's going to give us uh, the i and the j. Uh, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, just add these up, right? So we can go ahead and do that. Um, and then now start building up our abstractions here, right? So if you think about what we need to do when we do uh, matrix multiplication, right? Uh, we're going to do the most simple thing where we kind of go element by element. And we are going to, uh, you know, perform a dot product of, you know, the row times the column. Uh, we're going to need to grab uh, the right column, right? So perhaps one, uh, maybe we'll go comment things out so it's not going to be distracting. Uh, maybe one intermediate thing we're going to want is ability to grab a column. So given this 2D seek, uh, we, and it's, you know, maybe remind ourselves, uh, we'll even comment this, right, you know. Uh, matrix uh, in uh, row major uh, layout, so we know what we're talking about, right? So we have a row major uh, matrix, and I want to grab a column, so now we're kind of going across that. What do I want to do? Well, I'm basically going to want to um, uh, grab some element from each row, right? So, for example, if I want to grab column I, what I want to do is I want to map uh, for each row. I want to take the i element, right? So that's kind of what this is doing, right? So it's going to return a collection of seek event, which is going to go in, you know, if I give it, you know, one, let's go ahead and grab it. So maybe we'll go ahead and, uh, oops, well, there we go. So you can see Matt, and then we'll even uh, do grab call of Matt, and let's say we want to do uh, one, right? Column one, right? So we can see what happens, right? So. You know, this is how we define that uh, matrix with that tabulate uh, in 2D. So it was adding up the things, right? You know, so row zero plus column zero, row zero plus column one, you know, et cetera. Um, and then uh, if we want to grab column one, right, you can see this column right here. That's what we got with our operation. Cool. So that worked, right? And this is kind of application of us doing math. And so this is the very concise, uh, you know, syntax. We could have said, you know, for a given row, I want to take the row of i, maybe the more verbose way of saying it, uh, and that's going to work just fine, of course. Uh, but you know, but we kind of, and that's also more documented, right? We're kind of saying, hey, this is a row. That way we can kind of orient the reader. But you know, we had the concise way, which is pretty uh, clear. We're just kind of going to go grab the i element of each one. Neat. Uh, okay, but now we've grabbed, we had the ability to grab a column. Cool. Uh, maybe we can move this uh, up. Oops. Okay, and then. Another operation that we need to do this is the ability to do a dot product, right? We also want, you know, to given, uh, you know, these two vectors where we we'll multiply them together to get that uh, new element value, right? So we have two sequences, right? And we want to multiply them together. So here's an example kind of using those elements we discussed earlier, right? Where 
we're going to uh, zip them together, right? So now we have you know, one collection, another collection, now we have a collection of tuples. So to uh, get those tuples out, uh, you know, we use this case that triggered a pattern matching, which we'll cover later in today's lecture. Uh, and then of course we can multiply them together. So we multiply them together, neat. All right, so now we have a collection of all the products, right? And then we want to reduce it for dot product, right? Dot product uh, adds them all up, right? So, hey, we can go ahead and use that nifty.sum we just learned about. And boom, we've done that, um, right? And uh, maybe just show an alternate way of writing out this tuple interaction. So I'm just gonna give them a tuple. I could also say, uh, you know, uh, to uh, multiply the two things together. Uh, you know, and that's going to give us the same uh, behavior. Uh, I don't think that's quite as clear, right? I don't like having to index tuples too much. Um, I think in this case, I would argue the one that I had there originally was probably uh, more clear. Uh, cool, so that's a, that's a dot product, right? And so you can see this is actually a pretty uh, concise way to kind of get through this, right? Imagine if you did this um, imperatively, right? What would we do, right? We'd probably uh, say, hey, uh, you know, we have this var total, and then we would say, you know, something like uh, for i and, you know, a dot length uh, total plus equals, you know, a of i uh, times b of i, right? Uh, oops, then we got, of course, return total, right? So that, that will uh, do the right operation, right? That should Why does it think A is an int? A should be the collection. Oh, thank you. Uh, so it's great to have a TA on the call. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I need to actually define the range, right? I, I should have already done for each. Um, or zip with index, right? We now have a plethora of options. Uh, and then um, the question came in, uh, what's the default behavior of zip It's collection of different links? Uh, default behavior of zip of collection of different links is it returns the zipped things of length up to the shorter of two collections, right? Uh, I generally, uh, you know, that's understandable behavior because it's a reasonable choice they made. Uh, you know, I, when I'm programming, I probably wouldn't want to potentially take advantage of that. I probably would, uh, you know, be reluctant to zip things that I don't suspect are exactly the same link. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not going to cause an error. It's going to return something that's the link of the shorter of two collections when it does the zip. Um, cool. So okay, so this is me doing it imperatively. Uh, you know, maybe today this does not instead look more attractive like this, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll convince you of that. Um, that's kind of a nice, more clear pattern. Uh, oddly enough, if you actually were to benchmark this, uh, I'm told, although I don't usually do such micro operations in Scala, uh, that the imperative style of var probably is faster, especially if you use a while loop rather than a for loop. Um, oddly enough, of all ways to iterate in Scala, while is the fastest, but that's, that's a too little of detail for now. I think we can go ahead and revert back to our happy, nice clear implementation and uh, leave that alone. Cool. All right, so now we have the pieces we need to do our operation, right? We have the ability to grab a column because our data structure was kind of throwing things row major. We need the columns to do the column major portion uh, to access the columns. We have the ability to do a dot product kind of compactly. And then uh, we can go ahead and put it all together. So let's put it all together and see what we have here. Okay, so we take in two matrices, both of these 2D seeks, right? So you can see the type here is, you know, it's a seek of type seek of type int, right? So these are gonna be, you know, a collection of collections of int, right? And we have two of them or two matrices coming in. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna go through the rows of A and we're gonna map them, right? So we're gonna get a row, uh, maybe we'll even uh, make it more explicit. Uh, it's a row of A, right? And then what are we gonna do? We are going to, in this case, we're actually gonna want that index because that's going to tell us, um, uh, oops, we actually don't need that at all. 
uh, no, sorry, within that we're gonna need the index, right? So within the row, we want to know the index within there, right? So that's the column index is gonna produce that by that zip, right? So we're using the case to match against that tuple. And as we're going through those rows of LA, we're actually getting out the elements of A, which in this case actually isn't super what we need, right? We actually really just care about getting that column index and the row of A. And then what we're gonna do, well, we're gonna take the dot product of the row of A in that column of B, right? Which we're gonna grab that column and then, you know, get the right index for it. Um, so, uh, you know, this is uh, correct, I hope. Uh, and uh, if you know, run it, we get a result. Uh, does one of these results pass, you know, simple scrutiny? Let's, for example, move you to the top left. Okay, so that's this row times that column, uh, you know, zero over zero, one, one, four, nine, 0 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9 is 14. Yes, okay, great. So that single cell in this single case, I think we're okay, we convince ourselves is correct. Um, and so yeah, so this is an example of us kind of using this functional programming. And yeah, I mean, you can see there's kind of different ways to do this. Perhaps maybe arguably doing this with a for loop is better, or maybe, um, actually, uh, since people are so excited about tabulate, let's redo this. We have tabulate, actually. That might be kind of a fun way to redo this uh, thing, to kind of play with and kind of see how things look, right? So maybe I might be more clear with tablets is kind of a bit more of a automatic uh, way of thinking about things, right? So we say, hey, this is gonna be uh, seek.tabulate, uh, and what's it gonna be? It's gonna be the uh, inner dimensions, right? So it's gonna be, um, what is that? That's gonna be uh, a.head.length, uh, comma uh, b dot uh, length right, and then given that, uh, let's go ahead and see, we have you know case, uh, you know i comma j, and so we want to multiply uh, a row of a right, which is easy to get uh, times a column of b. grab call, and we have two map moles defined, we should probably undefine that one, and oops, ah, I can see just a little more, we're going to temporarily cut that, and yeah, we're going to save answer, so yeah, maybe in this case, to tabulate the most clear, because it kind of does the iteration space for us kind of very elegantly, um, but, uh, you know, we were trying to play around for functional programming, so maybe it was good we did it the other way too. Um, cool. It's a little dense. I mean, it's kind of thing you can play with a little bit after a lecture, but I still do want to kind of go through these things, kind of show you can really have a lot of fun, kind of combining these operators together and going through collections. So, questions on this? That's another one of these, uh, you know, longer examples. Let's move on to pattern matching, right? So um, this kind of appears in a lot of places in the language, and it's kind of nice where it's actually pretty clever and healthy able to match things, right? In the sense that uh, you can get the same functionality being more explicit, but sometimes you can kind of write this much more concisely and kind of really get the things you want, right? And so in particular, you use matching for a few different things, right? You use matching to uh, you know, find a case you want. So it's kind of like a search feature, right? Uh, you also may want to use the matching to kind of bind variables. And you're gonna see examples of both of those. And it's kind of very fluid and um, interwoven those two things, right? So uh, if you're actually using the actual match operation, you're gonna use this keyword match. However, uh, sometimes you're actually using pattern matching functionality without even knowing it, without even using that match keyword, right? So what do you do? Well. Uh, in this case, it's kind of like a supercharged switch in this example we have here, right? So we have some value and we're gonna call match on it. Okay, uh, and what do we do? Well, you know, like, not unlike, you know, a switch statement that other languages you're familiar with, right? You can say for a case and you can, you know, define what it's looking for, right? So in this case, looking for an exact match. Uh, okay, it's looking for exactly zero. Uh, and hey, if we give it a zero, uh, we're gonna get a zero out. Cool. Um, in this case, we're looking for a one. Uh, or, 
a three, right? We can now write, you know, multiple cases that have the same behavior. We can just put the same line with this or kind of in there. It's kind of nice functionality. Um, now we can also uh, use it to bind. So here we're binding whatever the match is to X, but then we're adding a qualifier to it. So rather than just taking X, we're saying, hey, I want to do something with it. So if this is true, right? So if, you know, in this case, we're saying, hey, if it's even, it's even, it's going to match. Okay, if somehow we manage to get past all of this, uh, you know, say in this case, looking for five, it's a contrived example. Uh, we'll say, hey, you know, five, you, you found it. Uh, good job. Um, cool. And then there's also a default, right? So if nothing else matches, uh, you can go ahead and toss in a default. And it's going to match against anything that's remaining, and you deal with that, right? And so um, that's probably one of the more common areas you may come across uh, in code is that you're going to see like, you know, Scala match error, Scala match error, right? And what's going on is somewhere in someone's match statements, some type got somewhere where it didn't expect and they were trying to match against it and then the conditions matched against it and thus it fell through. So even for example, in the notebook, um, actually is that easy for me to share? Uh, maybe not. If you go digging inside the source code for these notebooks, you will see an Ammonite file, which uh, only matches on a successful chisel compilation, right? So if, you, if you've ever experienced a bug uh, and have a really cryptic error message, which we've seen plenty of times in Chisel, uh, that's because we aren't catching, or we don't have a case to catch the uh, erroneous condition, right? And the reason why not is the erroneous condition, if we catch it, this, this can still tell us it's an erroneous condition. Um, so we make the exception go away and just say you have an error, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, using this wildcard or using this, you know, kind of default thing, if you actually do something with it, it's helpful, but you know, sometimes it's actually good to kind of leave it off there so that way when there's not a match, you can be alerted to it. But it's worth being aware that the compiler is not going to force you to have a complete covering, right? It's possible that you can have, you know, something passed into here that's not going to be covered by one of these cases, in which case it's going to have a match error. Uh, and so you have a match error unless you definitely covered all the cases or you put this uh, default case in. Um, Yeah, and then there's a suggestion from chat saying, hey, you can go ahead uh, and use this placeholder and you can do something, right? You can say uh, other, you know, and you can remind ourselves, ooh, that's actually probably not going to work. Um, it's, it often has a hard time using the wildcard interpolation inside of strings. Um, but this will probably work, right? Nope. Oh, you're right. We could, we, we could just say, you know, yeah. In which case, then, yeah, yeah, that's totally doable. Uh, oops, not. Yikes. Okay, so, yeah. Um, so you could, you could be more specific about it. Um, yeah, that's a good point. That's what Jerry says from the student point. You can do it that way as well. So maybe we'll leave that in for now. We'll change it at the end. Yeah, so you can kind of see these all these cases uh, playing out, right? Oops. We have to give it something. All right. So yeah, here it is doing the binding. Uh, and we can go ahead and use that binding later on. OK, so initially we said, hey, 10, 10 is even. Uh, and then, oops, good catch by the TA. Um, and then, OK, yeah, well, sure. If I put in 0, we get 0. Uh, you know, I put in 1, we get 1. You know, this is behaving kind of like we expect. Um, and then, you know, we get, you know, Hey, we're trying to find five, and then we give it something else. It found something else, right? It found the other, right? And so uh, this little compact example, right? I mean, it's kind of silly just numbers and kind of playing with it, but it, it's starting to show the flexibility of this feature in a language, right? You can really kind of match against a lot of stuff. And so, for example, when might you use this pattern matching in Chisel? Well, since so today is mostly in Scala, but in Chisel, this is something you might frequently use when dealing with parameters, right? So someone may give you parameters, you may want to handle certain cases, right? And you may imagine very rich, um, Cases, uh, parameters coming into your uh, generator were expressed as case classes, perhaps, and you kind of want to go in and handle various conditions and things. You could do a lot of, you know, ifs and if elses and stuff, but or you can kind of do things more gracefully sometimes by doing using the pattern matching and the, um, etc. Cool. Um, maybe we'll go ahead and revert that so you can see the wildcard in practice. But 
uh, yeah, it's it's pretty nifty. Um, so here we're doing it uh, just kind of you know pretty straightforward you know single thing coming in and you know um, working on it. We can go ahead and also use it in some other cases. So uh, what if we used it on case cuts? Like I just mentioned before, what has to be used for in Scala. So uh, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, make us imaginary world where we want to track uh, vehicles, right? So, uh, for example, we have you know very uh, eccentric individuals who you know either have you know helicopters or submarines. And uh, okay, so what do we do? Well, we have case classes. You know, we want to know, hey, we will say what color it is, what driver it is, and realize that the type information also tells us what it is, right? So we notice the helicopter uh, based on that, right? Um, and uh, these are both vehicles, so we're extending uh, this vehicle uh, abstract class. And then if we want to go ahead and make some initial data to play with, let's say, you know, some movers. So we have, you know, a gray helicopter that's uh, being driven by Marta, you know, a blue helicopter being driven by Laura, or a yellow submarine that's uh, being driven by Paul, right? So we can go ahead and uh, use um, match to work on these, right? So, um, here I'm just doing a for each because we're going to print, but you can imagine you don't have to use for each. You could use you know any one as collective as you wanted. Uh, we're just matching what we're found, right? So we're given some object, and we want to know you know how we're going to deal with that, right? So here we're doing that kind of binding style, and you can intermix them. But here we're doing a binding style. So hey, say if you find a helicopter, uh, call it H, and you know let's go ahead and deal with it, right? Uh, you know or um, if somebody uh, uh, you know has a summary, great, you know this right. And here we're using the you know of course string interpolation to describe it. So okay, we get the color of what it is. So we'll go ahead and comment that out and let this first portion run. And yeah, okay, you know we uh, ran it on this collection. And yeah, yes, it's a gray helicopter, a blue helicopter, and a yellow summary. Okay, not super crazy, but you know it's kind of nice, concise syntax about how to express that. Now, here we're kind of showing a little bit of interesting stuff here, where um, what are we doing? Well, we're also going through them. Uh, this is kind of a common thing you run into. Sometimes you're running with a collection and you want to match on it. You have, you're, given, you're given an element and you want to match an element. Uh, so at first, maybe you want to name things explicitly, but you actually can kind of be a little more compact by using that uh, placeholder. Um, okay, so even with that placeholder, uh, you know, we have a similar construct, kind of short it down. We could do the same thing and define, uh, you know, a type and just bind the variable, or we actually can have things where it's matching again. So here, what we're saying is, um, we're doing a few things here, right? Number one, we are saying, try to match for a helicopter type. There's one of the nice things about case classes. Case classes let you do this kind of matching so well. And we're only going to match uh, if it's blue, right? And while you're at it, uh, when you do match, go ahead and bind uh, the variable owner uh, to, oh, sorry, it's not even shouldn't be owner. I guess it should be uh, driver, but uh, it's to driver. And um, go ahead and bind that variable, right? So it's kind of a nice way to kind of break it all up, right? So, um, you know, maybe it's worth, uh, if I did this maybe more explicitly, to kind of show you what the benefit of this uh, niceness is, right? Uh, you know, otherwise I would say, hey, we have a helicopter, you know, if h dot color, you know, equals blue, and then I would also need to uh, say, you know, h dot driver, right? And so, yeah, I mean, uh, that works, right? And you can see that kind of falling in. If we didn't even have pattern matching in the first place, you might have to do, you know, some sort of, you know, is instance of class kind of stuff. But with well, the pattern matching, is pretty nice, right? We're able to kind of put in specific literal sometimes we want to actually match against certain things. We can uh, bind uh, internal field variables of that thing. So rather than having to go, you know, like h dot something, we can just have that thing ready to go. Um, 
or you can do dead weights. You can kind of see it's a very flexible feature, right? And in this case, uh, you know, for example, I only want to print out in these cases, and there's not a match. I'm choosing just to do nothing, right? Which is totally okay. You can totally just say I want to do nothing. So you can see we had three things in the collection. Uh, you know, uh, this gray helicopter is not going to match either of these, right? Because it's a helicopter, but it's not blue. It's going to try against the submarine, but the submarine, of course, is not a helicopter, so it's not going to match up. Uh, so it's going to be it's completely ignored, basically. It's going to do nothing. Four H is not going to have anything told to do with it, so it's going to do nothing. Of course, the blue helicopter from Laura is going to pop up, and then the yellow submarine is also going to pop up. We kind of see that there. So, okay, but you can see this is still a pretty uh, nifty feature. Um, we can really kind of very expressively kind of do things. And you kind of seen us even in those anonymous functions earlier, we're using this case, you know, pattern matching to allow us to um, kind of pull things together. Great, uh, questions on this? Great, so they said this is pretty flexible. Um, you can evoke a match. This is where the case test is really coming in the shine. You can go ahead and match on these fields directly. Um, for example, one place where I've used these extensively is for research. One of the things I've built is something called Essent, which is a uh, chisel simulator. It's really, really fast. And as I'm dealing with the uh, internals of the chisel language, it's turned into an intermediate rotation, you know, an IR, which is called Fertile, which you may have seen that name kind of leak out in our course. And uh, when doing that IR, it's actually all uh, these case classes. So I actually can go in and say, hey, I want to go find an add node, at least I'm going to add node. And it's really easy to just match against it and do things like that. So it's actually building these kind of algebraic-like things with case classes. It's like unfathomably concise and nice um, with Skull. Uh, so that's kind of a really nice uh, pro of uh, this language for all the headaches you deal with. Cool. All right, well, let's keep going then. So. Uh, as promised, uh, we want to talk about how maybe to be more graceful with option, right? So, uh, to get ourselves started, maybe we'll go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, first just make a collection, which, you know, somehow, in this case, we decided to make all odd things uh, exist and all even things none. So, remember before, oops, if we were dealing with this, we would probably do like a for each, and then you'd be like, you know, uh, you know, x, and then be like, you know, if, you know, x dot is defined, uh, you know, print line x, right? Oh, I said x dot uh, get, right? So, okay, that's kind of a mouthful, um, right? Uh, and this, at this point, you're probably wondering, well, gee, why are doing these options, right? And you guess technically numbers cannot exist, but that seems like a lot of work, right? Um, yeah, that's a lot of work. This is why, you know, if the find and get aren't uh, super familiar to TA and myself because we do them so rarely. Uh, but what you could do is you could say, uh, you know, uh, you want to go through them. Okay, you print the elements directly, it's going to um, print what they are. However, if you are dealing with uh, an individual element, so not collection, an individual option, uh, it'll actually do nothing, right? So uh, if you say, or maybe I should go make that more clear. So zero is a none, right? So zero is going to do nothing. One actually is something. So let's go ahead and do that, right? And so um, this is pretty cool, right? Because you can imagine uh, here we're doing um, uh, like that. Um, but you also, of course, can, you know, like, uh, you apply some map or other things, right? So it's pretty neat. Uh, if you wanted to just squeeze out the nuns, of course, you could use flatten. That's going to squish them out. Um, and uh, the most common way I actually end up dealing with options is like this down below. And it's using the pattern matching, which we just covered. Uh, and that is, we can go ahead and uh, give it an element. Um, we can match against it. And you know, hey, we can say sum, and then we use that binding to go ahead and bind what variable we're dealing with. Uh, or we can say, you know, was empty, right? And yeah, um, oops. So that's um, one of them, or maybe we'll go ahead and uh, do, you know, all of them, right? Um, so cool, right? This is kind of maybe a more graceful way to deal with um, 
uh, these options. Uh, so yeah, so now we have a pretty rich arsenal, right? We've covered all these crazy functional operators in Scala. We've covered the pattern matching uh, with options to kind of allow us to do things. Case classes are a nice way for us to kind of encapsulate parameters coming into our uh, generators. We have a really uh, rich set of like, features going forward for us in this language. Um, and so uh, in the remaining lectures, uh, what are we going to be covering? Well, next week we're going to be covering some details about inheritance and type parameterization and that sort of stuff. But in terms of the Scala features, we're kind of coming to the end of what we're going to cover in this course. And so really, now that we've covered so much Scala and this good amount of chisel, uh, we're going to kind of be getting in more into um, uh, how do we apply it and even just what we already have, making the most of it and actually using it is we're going to kind of keep covering and kind of what are good patterns for making good hardware designs and that sort of stuff. Um, this is perhaps going to be a good uh, point to stop for today. Uh, I'll take any questions in the remaining. So today was mostly about these kind of scholar things, kind of crossing up the last details about functional programming, check, you know, pattern matching, check, and options, check. And next we're going to cover a lot more things about uh, algebra and kind of inheritance kind of stuff. Well, okay. I think it's a quiet day, uh, but maybe everyone's a little worried about homework two uh, due tonight. Uh, best of luck on that. Uh, please continue to use Slack to try to both send and receive help. <laughs> uh, and with that, uh, have a good Friday, folks.